From Jacob Zuma and the state capture inquiry to the misappropriation of COVID relief funds. We can go back. The Infogate star scandal. We can go back. British imperialism and Cecil John Rhodes. Or maybe we can go back to the first corrupt politician in South Africa. Landed in April in 1652. Jan van Ribbeek. Corruption goes deep into the heart and runs deep in South Africans' veins. Of course, corruption is not a victimless crime. It is the most vulnerable South Africans who suffer. But that does not mean that we can have an irreverent look on corruption in South Africa, the history of corruption in South Africa. And there are two books um, that I've recently finished and it's absolutely a great take on the discussion on corruption in South Africa. The first of those book is a book called Rogue's Gallery. It's about the history of corruption in South Africa. From Lord Charles Somerset, Cecil John Rhodes to in Fogate to uh, defunct South African newspapers that propped up the apartheid regime to the Sarafina scandal. But I also just finished a book, a book that I'll be talking about at the Franchuk Literary Festival. Uh, it's a book called uh, Milk the Beloved Country. It's written by um, Cicely Kumalu and we're having a discussion about things that are utterly hilarious in South Africa. How the South African taxpayer, you and me, the South African taxpayer includes the person who pays VAT for what Chappie's bubblegum also contributes to the South African fiscus and how we're absolutely being mulked by those who are in power. Not the post-94 government, but everyone that's been in power in South Africa. So I'm joined today by my two guests, Matthew Blackman, who is one of the authors, along with Nick Dahl, of Rogue's Gallery, A History of uh, Corruption in South Africa, and then also Sihle Kumalu, Milk, the Beloved Country. Matthew, Sihle, thanks so much for joining us. Matthew, I think I'll start uh, with you. Um, corruption, pervasive, it runs through our veins in South Africa, whether it's grand corruption on a state, uh, on a state level, or whether it's me asking Zane Johnson if he knows someone at the traffic department that can maybe lower my, my traffic fines. Corruption runs deep in our veins here in South Africa, doesn't it? Good morning, Beth Matthew. Yes, um, it really does. And actually, during the process of writing that book, um, it just, it really, you know, I became aware that it really is our national sport. I mean, it is absolutely pervasive in every age in every sort of group that's ever had power in this country whoever they are there has always been um, an um, amendment to their to their acts and that has been about corruption so um but and you know some of it is hilarious and as we had lived through the zuma period in particular there were things that were you know, they, they're hilarious in retrospect. When you're living through them, they seem, you know, absolutely gobsmackingly crazy. But, um, you know, our, our corruption, one thing when, when we wrote that book, we were very firm on is that we mustn't believe that this is something that just happened with the ANC, that suddenly miraculously, oh, there was this thing called corruption and the ANC were, you know, we have lived under, I mean, the ANC have been particularly good at it, um, but but it is something that goes deep in our history. And all of the tricks that the ANC have got up to, they are all tricks that have been perpetuated by yeah. all of the people that you mentioned, Lord Charles mm -hmm. Somerset, you know, the Bruderbond, um, the information scandal. And and we'll get to some of the characters uh, that you write oh. about in Rogue's Gallery. But but Cicely Kumalu, author of Milk the Beloved Country, I'm looking forward to chatting to you on, on, on Sunday. People will say, how dare you make fun of this very, very serious story, this very serious issue of corruption that affects the most vulnerable in South Africa. But it is, in fact hilarious some of the schemes and the methods that have been used in the story of corruption as part of the South African story is funny it's hilarious it's ironic during COVID times there was a church in Cape Town that was preaching an anti 
COVID message, as in an anti-protection, COVID is a hoax message. But at the same time, they transformed the church in a company that sold personal protective equipment, and then they made money off the state. That has a sense. It's very dark, but it has have a sense of humor in that story, Cecily. Look, as Matthew has said, seemingly corruption is a national sport in this country. And what I'm trying to do in the book is to come up with this narrative, because there's this strong narrative in this country, and you alluded to to it earlier on, that says fraud, corruption, money laundering is almost a new thing. It started in the post-1994 era. And I'm just saying in the book, amongst other things, that look, we've been doing this for a very, very long time. It's, it's, it's a fact of life. In fact, one of the things that I talk about in the book is, so what if the terms of reference of the State Capture Commission did not look at just one administration and one administration only? Why are we as South Africans comfortable with the fact that we're just looking at one administration? Why don't we look at other administrations over and above Jacob Zuma's, including, by the way, FWT Clacks and PW Bothers? Why strictly just one administration and one administration only? So that's some of the things that I'm raising. And I'm saying, look, there's so much that has happened in this country, both post-1994 and indeed before 1994. And uh, we should, especially if we call ourselves patriots, and a number of us actually call ourselves patriots, but seemingly we are very comfortable with certain administrations not knowing what happened in other administrations and very comfortable in exposing certain mm. leaders. Like this comment here, Matthew, uh, Cecil John Rhodes was a genius businessman who built South Africa into the only industrial conglomerate, conglomerate, I'll get it right eventually, south of Rome. But you write in your book that um, Cecil John Rhodes had to bribe his way. In fact, Queen Victoria didn't in fact want him to be deployed as governor of the Cape. There was very much a concern that he bribed a, 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 a Irish political party in the UK parliament to vote for him so that he could be deployed to the Cape and be governor here in, at the Cape Colony. Well, so that was um, around the British South Africa company. Yes. No, I mean, look, Rhodes, uh, remarkably, even in his time, you know, Olive Schreiner in particular, and and the people that the the kind of liberal politicians around her, uh, particularly James Rose Innes, all knew and wrote letters to one another. And actually, it was published in the Cape Times. All knew that Rhodes was fundamentally corrupt. Um, you know, Rhodes tried to bribe James Rose Innes, who was a, a cabinet minister and a, a member of parliament, with a whole lot of shares at one point. And there's this hilarious letter where. James Rose in a sense back to him and sort of says, you know, thank you for this very, very generous gift. But, you know, my thinking in Parliament just won't be clear, completely clear if I have these, you know, shares in my bank account. But thank you so much for for um, for, for giving me that. Um, so, you, you know, Rhodes was one of the most fundamentally corrupt people um in our in our country i mean there is absolutely no question around around that at all it's it, you know he is um a, a, a he sort of set up a lot of the systems of corruption um and you know pretty much everything he did was about gaining you know financial um gain through th through his actions as a politician he very rarely seemed to care about politics it was mainly about trying to increase the size of his mm. various bank accounts. Uh, we say it largely as tongue-in-cheek, Jan van Riebeek, 1652, the first corrupt politician in South Africa, wouldn't be the last, but essentially sent to the Cape um, by the Dutch East Key India Company as a, almost as a second chance he had caught on a, uh, a, a lot of nonsense in his first um, at his first post posting, and being sent to the Cape was seen as whether well, we want to see it as a second chance or maybe even a punishment to go look after this outpost at the bottom edge of Africa after catching on all sorts of corrupt nonsense at, at previous postings. Yes, no, I mean the reason why he was sent to South Africa was that he was caught involved in corruption in in his posting at, in Vietnam and he was sent to you know the sort of kind of ends of the earth to to um to make to make good um and uh you know what he set up in the cape you know although there wasn't 
corruption in the sense of what we think of it now of kind of stealing from the state or whatever you know he set up essentially a, a pretty corrupt and morally corrupt um system uh so although he wasn't in south africa involved in a clear case of financial corruption he was associated with corruption and you know the system he he set up he was initially told to you know treat the locals kindly and 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 with respect and he certainly didn't do any of that Cecil, are you there with us Yes, I am. Um, we lost yes, you on I the Zoom link, but we have you on the phone line. Uh, politicians will always try to cleanse their image. And since the time of Willem Adrian van der Stel, one of the, the descendants of um, Simon van der Stel, what, being one of the first politicians, also a former governor, of of the Cape back then, after being catching on all sorts of nonsense in the Cape Colony, he finds himself back in the Netherlands, but he spends the last 10 years of his life writing books and opinion pieces, trying to clear his name or clear his image. Politicians have always tried to whitewash their dirty hands, drenched in the oily mess of corruption scandal. Yes, indeed. And I think uh, it's a classic case of Willem van der Stel, as you rightfully say, that he eventually made his way back to the Netherlands and tried to clean his uh, his status, as it were. But they will always try and do that. And, and I think this talks to us as the people of the land. Why in the first place, when we see and when we hear reports, when we read reports about corruption, why do we defend the undefendable? I think sometimes we tend to blame the politicians so much when actually the ball is in our court. Why do we take so much that we take as South Africans as an example? And I really think more than anything else, yes, we have to question the politicians, but also as South Africans, generally speaking, we must also question ourselves, why do we take this nonsense as you put it? So that's the first part. The second part, uh, Lester, that I would like to touch on just briefly is that, yes, indeed, there is corruption in the public sector, but we must not, also not forget that there is corruption in the private sector. And sometimes we hardly, if ever, talk about corruption in the private sector. And one of the things that I talk about in the book, which we'll be talking about on Sunday in France, Hook, is the 2010 uh, World Cup uh, stadia fixing of uh, the stadia breakers as well. Um, imagine that. And for me, it's one of the things that somehow we spoke about it briefly and poof, it was mm-hmm. gone. We never delved into it that there must be people who made loads and loads mm-hmm. of money regarding the price fixing of the stadia. And if you think about it logically, without the stadia, there would have been no World Cup. Mm-hmm. And so there were individuals who figured up that you know we've got them now we really got them if we can fix our gross profit margin at 17.5 we'll be smiling all the way to the <laughs> bank and 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 what happened indeed so those individuals i'm sure by now they are retired somewhere living oh. a good life and here we are still struggling and this is part of the conversation that we need to have is that mm. yes there's corruption in the public sector but also there's corruption in the private sector and just like we need to have the conversation that there's Corruption post-1994, but indeed there was corruption pre-1994. I don't know, Cecil, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but that month in 2010 was the best 10 million bribe we ever spent to get the World Cup here to Jack Warner, eh? (laughs) 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 I don't know, I don't know. Matthew, Matthew, we know the state gives the money to build the roads and the private company then builds the roads. But even with a character of like Wampo Kruger, we, we often speak about tenderpreneurship, on point construction. We get the money from the state, and you know what? We're going to use that money and we're going to outsource it to other companies because we can't build a road for anything. And Paul Kruger, there's evidence that he did that. He got state contracts to build roads in and around Pretoria, but who did he give the contract to? He gave it to his, was it his son-in-law? And then the son-in-law got other people to build the roads, and this is how we have this theory, this era of tenderpreneurship, starting from honest womb whole career, all the way back then. There's a, a, a black poet called Robert Grendon who wrote a, a, an amazing poem called Paul Kruger's Dream um, at the time. And in, in this poem, he talks about all of that corruption that, that Kruger was involved in. So even at the time, you know, people were perfectly aware that Paul Kruger, and we seem to have forgotten 
um, you, you know, all of this. One thing that um, Sichle actually brought up about commissions, there were commissions in the Witter era time, there was something called the Picard Commission of Inquiry and was fundamentally corrupt. And actually, there's a beautiful piece um, of uh, a, a sort of notice put out by the ANC at the time after the Picard um, Corruption Commission that sort of said, you know, we'll look at the National Party, they're so terribly corrupt, and we won't, you know, once we're in government, we will not be corrupt like mm. the National Party has been corrupt. Mm. I mean, you know, that, you know, so, so you know, this that's the kind of irony of, mm. the, of where we where we are. And that's a bit of the sentiment. It's, it's true that there's always been corruption, uh, but we expect it different from the ANC. We have Julian in Greenpoint. Good morning, Julian. Yeah, I just wanted to make the comment that, you know, government officials love to point to private sector corruption. But the difference is, and it's fundamental, is there are consequences. And your previous caller said, I mean, it's just completely false that the construction companies rode into the sunset. They didn't ride anywhere. They were fined billions and billions of rand by the Competition Commission, and those companies now are almost bankrupt and had to raise money from shareholders. And if you take the G4S saga that everyone says, look, look, how corrupt private companies are, those employees of G4S are in the dark now, facing 10 and 20 year jail sentences. And if you ask yourself how many government Department of Correctional officials are facing any of those charges, that's the only difference. Yes, corruption does happen in the private sector. However, if you are caught and if you are found, there are severe sanctions of jailing and fines and, and never working in the industry. Mm. However, for government officials, you just get shoveled off to another department or become an M. Mm. Appreciate that, Julian. Uh, Cecilia, I'll give you the, 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 the last word. Do we, um, the only person ever convicted for an arms deal related offence, ironically, is Tony Engeni, a man who was just off before this last ANC conference, was head of the ANC's NEC task team on, on corruption. He's the only person found guilty of any arms deal related offense. And it wasn't even really for, for stealing, it was for getting an undeclared discount of 500,000 Rand for, for Mercedes Benz SUV. It is dark, but it is absolutely laughable that that is the only real outcome from any form of an investigation into the arms deal. A prison sentence for a discount for a SUV, not even real corruption, if, the, if I can even make that distinction, see, Claire? Yeah, I know. It's very interesting. Just briefly on the last caller that spoke about uh, corruption in the private sector, let's just be clear that uh, when you are talking about the executives of those uh, companies, nobody went to jail. So that's a fact of life. And the fine for that matter was paid by the company, not the executives, actual people who met in certain restaurants and discussed those things. We just need to be clear on that. So on the arms deal, it's, yeah, you, you're absolutely right that uh, it's seemingly this arms deal issue, maybe it was never actually about the arms. Maybe initially it was also just about we need to get the back hands. Maybe, in fact, the whole issue of, okay, we need to buy arms, maybe that was a secondary issue. The, the primary issue is how do we get like a big deal where we can, certain individuals mm. might get uh, back hands. So it will be interesting in the next couple of months, stroke years, what will happen with regards to the arms deal and other people potentially mm. who were involved as well. I do encourage people to go out and get uh, Rogue's Gallery. It's a history of corruption in South Africa, written by uh, Matthew Blackman, Nick Dahl. And I'll be speaking to Sishle Kumalu this coming Sunday at the Franschuk Literary Festival at 10 o'clock, talking about his book, Milk the Beloved Country. It's about how the South African taxpayer has been milked, not just post-94, but from 1652 onwards. <laughs>